Welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian. Let's get to today's conversation. I spoke with Brittany Bookbinder, who is co-host of the podcast, Jury Duty, The Trial of Robert Durst. And if you guys have been wondering what Bob Durst has been up to since HBO's documentary, The Jinx, well... This is your episode because he is on trial for the murder of Susan Berman. And Brittany has been following this closely along with her team at Crime Story Media. Pause here to talk about Crime Story Media. This is a digital platform that weaves together stories of criminal justice, true crime, in a very thoughtful, smart way. Go to their website, explore their articles, and you'll also find their podcast, Jury Duty, which is embedded in their site. And just you'll see all the work they do. They deep dive into cases and they really analyze the criminal justice system. So I will leave it at that because this has previously aired for patrons only. So there's an intro in the audio that gives you a little more context. So with that, please enjoy my conversation with Brittany Bookbinder of Jury Duty, The Trial of Robert Durst. Hey, diehards, welcome to this episode of Trialogue, a courtroom conversation, during which I speak to Brittany Bookbinder, who is co-host of the podcast, Jury Duty, The Trial of Robert Durst. We're going deep in on Bob, guys. Buckle up. And if you haven't seen The Jinx, I feel like if you're listening to this podcast, you have seen The Jinx. If for some reason you haven't, you need to make sure you add that to your summer watch list. This podcast is a real-time trial coverage. It's being reported as the trial unfolds and therefore has the latest, the greatest, the weirdest, which you'll hear, details on Bob Durst's trial for the murder of Susan Berman. Now, you may remember Bob Durst for other crimes, including the murder and dismemberment of Morris Black and the possible connection to the disappearance of his wife, Kathy. We will get into all of that with Brittany who again is the co-host of Jury Duty, The Trial of Robert Durst, which she hosts alongside Carrie Anthelis. And Jury Duty is an output of Crime Story Media, which if you've never discovered, I will put it in the show notes. It's called crimestorymedia.com. And it's basically this intersection of criminal justice and storytelling. Really, really good true crime content coming out of there, including this podcast I first got hooked on season one, which was the beginning of this trial. Now they're in season two. There was a long 14-month delay between trials, but they are back, and this is happening in Los Angeles, and I wanted to know the latest, and I wanted to know what it feels like in the courtroom, and if it's as bananas as it appears to be. Seems the answer is yes. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Brittany Bookbinder. Be sure to check out Jury Duty from Crime Story Media, link in the show notes. I hope you are having a wonderful summer. Okay, Brittany, welcome to Dialogue Podcast. And this conversation specifically will feature on Trialogue, which is our courtroom conversation companion show. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's honestly my pleasure. And I'm probably going to give you the biggest challenge you've had uh, during your whole coverage of the Robert Durst trial, because I'm going to ask you to give us the highlight reel as well as a brief background, all under 30 minutes, which how do you even do that? This case is so bananas. And your coverage is deep. So I thought maybe a good place to start would be a quick overview of Durst's three, some of which I guess they're all alleged at this point. Well, one, we know, no, they're kind of all alleged. His crimes for anybody who's not up to speed on like what first happened, then what happened and now what's happening with Durst. Could you do that? Absolutely. So Robert Durst is on trial currently for the murder of Susan Berman, who is his best friend from his college years in California. And the crime that he is alleged to having committed, the the murder, goes all the way back to 1982. In the early 80s, in the 70s and early 80s, he was married to a woman named Kathy. And Kathy Durst disappeared mysteriously in 1980. The allegation against him is that he is responsible for her death. And the further allegation uh, by the prosecution in this case is that 
Susan Berman helped him cover that up by providing an alibi for him. She is alleged to have called Albert Einstein Medical Center, which is where Kathy was in medical school, very close to graduating and becoming a doctor and becoming financially independent and in a position that she felt would allow her to get the divorce that she had been seeking from Robert Durst. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So Susan Berman alleged to have provided this alibi by making a phone call the morning after Kathy's death or Kathy's disappearance. And then years later, when she, Susan, that is, was in a period of extreme financial hardship, is alleged to have attempted to extort her friend, Bob, for money, uh, saying that the authorities were trying to talk to her and kind of insinuating that, you know, she had this information that she might share, although everyone pretty much agrees that she would not have have actually done that. And in fact, the authorities were not trying to talk to her. But this was, you know, Like another important point, I think, just to bring up that's really helped my understanding of this case is that in the year 2000, the New York Westchester DA was reopening the investigation into Robert Durst. So sort of at that point, he I think his his anxieties were heightened and that really kind of snowballed into this what might be termed paranoia over his friend Susan. And then after he left L.A., went to Galveston, which is where he met Morris Black, the man who he dismembered. In Galveston, he was, I believe the trial was in 2003. He was acquitted of murder, but, you know, admitted to dismembering the body because a gun went off in his apartment that killed Morris Black. That's, that's the kind of the whole thing in a nutshell. Yeah. The craziest nutshell you could ever think of. And if let's just say, I mean, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself, but if he's responsible for Kathy's disappearance, we know he killed Morris Black, whether it was in self-defense or not, as he claims. And now he's on trial for Susan Berman's murder. Does this make him a serial killer? If all of that were true, he would technically qualify, wouldn't he? Yeah, I think by the technical definition, he he would. But I think our cultural understanding of a serial killer is kind of steeped in the tradition of, you know, men killing a series of white women for pleasure. I think, you know, generally speaking, that is how we use the term or, you know, in some cases like Son of Sam, like couples, those are sort of like the more famous ones. I think, you know, and I, I think about this a lot because there have been other allegations against Durst. He, you know, has been kind of associated with investigations to some degree of missing young women. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yes. Not much has come of these allegations. And in fact, one, you know, was kind of written off pretty quickly by authorities because it it kind of seemed like people in the area, you know, had heard that maybe he had been there and because they were aware of him, just sort of like zoned in. But there was no actual evidence tying him to this one. Okay. The other one in Vermont, there's a a young woman who was uh, last seen at a bus stop eating some snacks that she had just purchased at All Good Things, which is the health food store that he and Kathy owned up in Vermont. That, I think, is still an ongoing investigation. And there's another young woman in California, Northern California, where he had a house who also disappeared. And, you know, technically, I think he is maybe considered still a suspect. He hasn't been ruled out, but there's been, you know, I mean, the the investigation is still very much open. Okay, well, then I'm doubling down on the serial killer uh, theory because, oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand that the three, the, the main three we're talking about, Morris Black, Kathy Durst, and Susan Berman, it seems like these are situations where he was feeling pinned against a wall out of options, which isn't really how a serial killer operates, right? He wasn't out yeah. stalking prey in the same thrill kind of seeking way, but at the same time, he's serially a danger to other people, it would seem. So, yeah, I mean, my my kind of understanding and I I do not have a background in psychology. I'm not a doctor. Do I. I, <laughs> right. I can't diagnose him. But it does seem like when um, under pressure and under the opinion that people are kind of squeezing him in yeah. one one way or another or pressuring him, basically trying to control him in some way, he 
lashes out. And, you know, my personal feeling on it is that it is less likely that he is involved in these other cases because it just doesn't seem like the if kind it of M.O. If right. he had one, it's yes. yes. Agreed. Agreed. OK, so bringing it back to present day, this trial for the murder of Susan Berman has been delayed. There was COVID. And then there's also just Robert Durst's condition. He's getting older, although he looks older than he actually is. He's almost 80, which is up there, but it's not. I mean, he looks like he's pushing 90. He does not look well. So can you talk about kind of what delayed in addition to COVID, what's kind of stalled the process and how is he right now? You have so many stories coming out on your podcast, Jury Duty with Carrie Anthelis, and a lot of them have to do with his physical condition in, in weird details. So <laughs> how is he right now? Can you talk a little bit about Bob Durst as he is right now? Absolutely. He, I don't think is, I mean, he's been better. That's, that's for absolute sure. But you're right. I mean, he... There are 78 year olds who are spry and, you know, moving about and he he is not, you know, but there are allegations, I think, by certain people who have been following the case that some of this is kind of being played up to kind of look a certain way. What we do know is that there was a period of time. There was one day it was a Thursday that he he was not in court. And when he returned the following Monday, he looked quite a bit different. He has been in a wheelchair during this iteration of the trial. And when he came back that Monday after having, you know, been been showing up in a suit jacket and like button down shirt, he was, I believe at that point or sometime, you know, that week because he was unable to stand and get dressed. He was in his jailhouse uniform and, you know, I think some people on the defense were maybe saying that that (laughs) was prejudicial because the jury would know that he's he had been in jail. Although, I mean, that's like kind of a whole can of worms about whether or not a jury would find that prejudicial because plenty of, of people uh, are waiting in jail and before, you know, and during their trial. So, but the prosecution kind of fired back that actually, you know, it, it's kind of more sympathetic. You know, he looks very frail. He certainly doesn't look like somebody who could have killed three people. So yeah, so he, and he, when he was there on Monday, he also had a catheter bag, kind of famously. <laughs> and there's like point. discussion around it. I mean, it's the weirdest thing to watch clips on court TV of the trial and for there to be, you know, many minutes around the catheter bag and holding it and the process of draining it. And did he position it so that the jury could see it or did he not? And then Durst himself spoke about it, which was surprisingly coherent, right? Yes. Right. So he, I mean, yeah, he, the theatrics around the catheter bag are huge, you know, waving it around, which of course involves lifting it higher than the level of the tube attachment, which of course is very dangerous, especially with somebody with liver problems, which he has. So, you know, all of that may have seemed a strategy on his part. Right. And then when he spoke, he was incredibly coherent, arguably more coherent than either of his attorneys that spoke. You know, they right. they sort of returned to the same tired narrative about how this is just why he shouldn't be in trial, he should be resting. And his attitude was like firing back at every single point raised by the prosecution. So, you know, there've been a number of instances since March, really, when he, you know, in in the hearings that have led up to this current iteration of the trial, that he has shown himself to be quite sharp, his, his wit just on point as ever. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think will, will affect outcome, right? If, if the jury is at all swayed by the fact that he's a little bit frail looking, but the fact that he can speak so articulately and advocate for himself, you know, that's going to impact them one way or another. Why has it taken so long for this to come to trial? How did he get out of um, Morris Black's uh, conviction and there, and maybe the investigation around Kathy Durst, but do you think it's his wealth alone? Do you think there are other factors? What do you, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, I think having $60 million really helps. <laughs> it sure does. I think, I, you know, I mean, I think there's, a, there's an article on crimestory.com that, you know, I think back to about these two hearings that were kind of going on at the, a similar time and how, you know, 
you you can buy your your way into the justice system and it's it's really unfortunate and i think you know for as much as we kind of like there there are so many theatrics about this trial and there's so many things to kind of poke fun at and i think like for me a reason that this trial is really so enjoyable to cover is because there there's comedy to it because everybody is like almost nobody is innocent, you know, right. not a single person associated wow. with this is fully, you know, I mean, not that, you know, obviously there's always nuance, nothing about people and our behaviors are purely black and white. But, you know, I think in this case in particular, there's just kind of a, a nice, just thick, amount of guilt just spread over (laughs) most of the people involved. And a lot of them are very wealthy and, and Durst in particular, you know, I mean, he, he bought his, his, he had like a buyout of his family trust. So he was able to control that money after shortly after his Galveston trial. And, you know, I think, I think that really has a lot to do with it. I'm sure there there are other factors. I mean, you know, the courts are always incredibly backed up. Sure. And, you know, there's logistical hangups. And, I, you know, I don't know because I only started working on this coming into the second season that we've done for wow. jury duty. But, you know, there, there may have been other, you know, just standard kind of delays. But, yeah, I mean, I think he, this is the thing that, that really kind of sets him apart. And, you know, I think as a cultural figure that we, a lot of people have been following since the jinx that, you know, you can see just, you know, his ability to grab the attention of a documentarian and be able to tell his story, his side of the story to such a massive audience is a privilege that most people on trial do not have. Absolutely. And if you can't you know, I like to think you can't necessarily buy an outcome of a trial, but you can really do a lot of damage before it and stall tactics and all of these things, which he had. I'm curious, how is he being held in prison? How has he not been able to get around that with bail or on bond or be at home for the duration of this? It surprises me that he's sitting in jail. That's a great question. And I'm not really sure. And I imagine that, you know, I mean, he he would clearly be a flight risk. So (laughs) that's true. He has proven himself a very shady flight risk who (laughs) not only when he's hiding, he steals things and commits crimes. Like he is truly, it's almost like a cast of characters. He's almost fictional. It's, it's so surreal. So catheter aside, (laughs) what, what has been the wildest moment that you've witnessed in court? And yeah, let's start there. Has there been one moment that stands out as like, I can't believe this is happening or that was really dramatic. Yeah. I mean, I would say there's a a couple of things that come to mind at the very beginning of the trial, right? I think it was the first week in the time around opening arguments. They they did sort of these mini abbreviated reiterations of their opening arguments to kind of remind the jury where they were headed. And sometime during that week, it appeared that the attorneys almost came to blows. I really thought there was going to be a fist fight in court and there wasn't, you know, but they, you know, raised their voices and it got very heated. So there was like a, you know, just a very heated moment there that, you know, and this is the first trial that I I have watched this closely. So I, you know, I didn't know, like, is this, um, is this common? I don't think it is. (laughs) I don't think so either. That was my next question was how many trials have you covered this closely? Are you used to being in a courtroom? Like what's that experience even been like? Personally? No, Uh, this is my first one. I am watching it remotely. Our, our reporter, Charlie Bagley, who covers the case for the times and for Mm -hmm. crimestory.com has been going into court. So getting his perspective on how things are playing for the jury is very interesting. And it's very heartening. I've got to say that he has repeatedly kind of noticed that the jury is still very much engaged, you know, paying attention. So that, that makes me feel good. There was another moment that was kind of shocking. And that was like the first time that he spoke, Robert Durst spoke in quite a while. And, you know, just, just hearing his voice is just yesterday, actually, he rather loudly announced to his attorneys sitting beside him that we should be objecting. And one of them stood up and did object. But that was, that was pretty wow. wild. Like, so just like bossing his lawyers around, like vocally, so people could hear. That's amazing. 
Yeah. Yeah. He, he is just fascinating. I mean, there's, there's no end. So your team is putting out a scripted or it's based maybe on transcripts, but it's more like a narrated version of the, is it the whole trial proceedings or is it like the story of Bob Durst? Could you tell us about that project? Oh yeah. So we've been working on a segment called Robert Durst in his own words. That is okay. you know, part of our, our recent episodes. And these segments are kind of like looking at his life through the words that he's said um, on record. And so some of that includes a testimony from earlier trials. And some of that includes the, you know, I think there are interviews maybe as well. The, the full list of sources are all on the website, but the BD story is kind of famously his document that he produced his, his autobiography. What is this? The BD story? Yes. The BD story is his life in his own words. And it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. So there are, yeah, some, some clips from, from there and, you know, just other, other things that he's said publicly uh, (laughs) about his experiences and his travels and his relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, his whole family is actually quite interesting. I know the brothers recently testified in court the Durst yes. brothers. And I actually used to work in marketing and real estate. So the Durst family, in, and I'm in New York, is mm-hmm. very well known in real estate to this day. You know, yeah. some of the younger family members were on conference calls that I was privy to, wow. but I'm a true crime person. So I'd always be like, that's Bob Durst's brother or niece. <laughs> and everyone's like, who? But they're kind of interesting as well. Their testimony has to be so powerful because they're his brothers and they are not holding back in terms of sharing their concerns about him being a danger, but it's conflicted. As family members, they had a a troubled childhood, difficult father, lost their mother tragically. What is their influence, do you think, on the proceedings? Yeah, I'm not sure, of course, you know, how the jury is interpreting any of this. You know, watching it for myself, I can say that it, it does seem to be a very dysfunctional family. But I don't know, you know, because on the other hand, <laughs> like of the four siblings, only one of them is on trial for murder. So this is you, true. This you know, is you true. Kind of, yeah, I wonder. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's very tragic, I think, you know, they're having lost their mother at such a young age. And then, you know, the, the youngest brother, Thomas, after their father died, kind of separated himself from the rest of the family, you know, decided that we didn't have anything in common, he said. So I don't think he's on speaking terms with anybody. And Douglas Durst, you know, I mean, you can only imagine really like fearing that your own brother is coming for you and having to hire security. To attend the trial, they both did, right? They brought personal private security. I don't know about Thomas, but I I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. He he actually testified in 2020. Maybe that's what I was listening to. Yes, we covered them both together. But the jury heard from him about a year ago. Got it. Yeah. Wow. Now, a big piece of the puzzle with Susan Berman is that Durst always maintained he wasn't in Los Angeles and couldn't therefore have murdered her in the year 2000. But recently it's come to light that he was in fact there, or do we really, really think he was? Have we proved he was he was there? Yes. So he has stipulated uh, that he he was, but this is a huge change. There were two really important changes that happened right before this trial started. One, you know, the, the prosecutor details in the opening statements that for years and years and in many interviews, both with authorities and with the Jinx producers, he claimed that he did not write the cadaver note. Right. He claimed that he was not in L.A., now he's claiming that he he did write the cadaver note and that he was in LA and that he discovered the body you know and and i think it it really appears to be that you know his his close friend who was an adverse witness who you know was really doing everything i think in her power to not do anything to damage him was the one to reveal that he had told her that he was in Los Angeles. Yeah. So, I mean, that feels like him retroactively fitting a story 
you know, to fit the crime scene that would make sense for him not to be the criminal. It feels like a Morris Black defense. Like, okay, it doesn't yes. look good. It, I mean, I, I, are we thinking he's probably going to be convicted of this? Or is that your gut feeling? And, and or do you feel like you're able to weigh in on that? I, don't, I really don't know. Yeah. I, I, you know, because it's it's tough, and it's not just, you know because I'm only one person and I'm not sitting in the courtroom, but it's also because the reality of it is that there really is not hard evidence as there would be in other murder cases. You know, there's no weapon, there's no fingerprints, there's no DNA. One might argue that a lack of fingerprint evidence is something, you know, however, it's not evidence in the conventional sense. So I don't know. I, you know, I don't know how that's going to land with the jury and I don't know how they're going to weigh that in, in their determinations. I don't think if he is convicted, I don't think he would be the first person to ever be convicted on circumstantial evidence alone, but you know, it's, it's not, I don't think it's a home run. You know, I, I think it's kind of really still, anybody's game. And I do think like, I often try to try to look at it from the other point of view and kind of consider like, okay, if he's saying that he genuinely felt like, oh my God, you know, he shows up, (laughs) he's somehow thinking he's going to spend a nice Christmas at the spa with Susan and her friend. And, you know, he walks in and you can just kind of picture the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme song playing (laughs) like, not again. Um, Okay, so what do you do in that situation? I mean, I don't know if you write a letter to authorities and then have to backtrack and explain like, I know, I know how this looks, but if I, you know, I look, don't shoot the messenger. Like, I don't, I I, I guess you kind of could make the case for it. It's a little, it's a little thin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's one of those cases where you're like, he's either guilty or the unluckiest guy in the world. And we've seen a couple other examples of that. And this would be just a major one. But it's important to do that exercise. I think you're right to walk through that and say, but what if? And that's that's a healthy thing to do. It's objective. But it is a, a reach for me. <laughs> I mean, just personally, I really am heartbroken when I think about Kathy Durst and that she's never been found. Do you know if the case is considered active? And do you think if he's convicted, that will change maybe the energy put towards that case or reopening it? Yeah, I, I actually think it has, there, there is some movement on it. Good. So her family has uh, hired a lawyer in Westchester who gave a press conference right at the beginning of the trial, this uh, iteration of the trial. Okay. And the Westchester DA has, I think, you know, reopened the investigation. So it's kind of anybody's guess, you know, I don't know how his conviction would, would factor into that, but it's, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's, it's horrible. It, it's such a tragic loss. She seems like, you know, just a really, a really tragic figure. And I don't know if her, any of her family members are, are going to testify in this trial, but I, you know, personally would be so curious to hear from them and, and just have their, their voices heard in all of this because it, it's so sad, you know? Yeah. She was on the cusp of the rest of her life, you know, right at that moment. Wow. Well, we will keep watching and listening to your coverage. Is there anything else about Bob Durst you feel like we should know before or the trial before we wrap it up? Oh gosh. I I think we've kind of covered, uh, you know, the, the main points. Plot points. Yeah. Has has SNL done a skit on this? Cause if they haven't, they should. It's, I mean, (laughs) The catheter bag alone, like I know they're going after like the housewives crimes. I guess those are a little, a little lighter in nature, but it's got all the ingredients. It's I know so you, you, you got his, his very uh, dark eyes, yeah, you got no, his high pitched voice. It's, some, some cast member yeah. would love to take that on. I'm sure. would love to see <laughs> Bo and Yang do that. That yeah. would be Oh my huge. gosh. Amazing. Well, Brittany, thank you so much for killing the small talk with me and bringing us up to speed on Robert Durst's trial. Thank you. You are listening to Trialogue, a courtroom conversation, a Patreon-only companion to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. Both podcasts are hosted and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian, audio engineered by Jason Esri. You can follow me at Dialogue Pod on all social media platforms. Learn more and sign up for my newsletter at RebeccaSebastian.com. Thank you for listening.